Trees are among the oldest living things on the planet, some say older than biblical creation would allow. Tree Ring Dating, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. And our topic this week is tree ring dating. Are there trees that are older than the biblical date for the flood or even older than creation? Right. Well, tree ring dating is also called dendrochronology. Yes. And dendrochronology is the science dealing with the study of the rings of trees in determining the dates of chronological order of past events. So the basic concept is that each year the tree forms new cells arranged in concentric circles, uh, you know, called annual rings or uh, annual growth rings around the tree. Right, these rings usually show the amount of wood produced during one growing season. In Canada and the, the uh, uh, North America, United States, and so on, the growing season begins in the spring, and at, at first the cambium produces numerous large cells with thin walls that form the spring wood, or the early wood. If you look at the cross-section of a tree, this is the light-colored portion of the ring. Right, and towards the end of the summer, uh, growth slows down, and the cells manufactured this time of the year are small, with thick walls. They form the summer wood, the, the late wood, which appears as the darker ring on the tree's cross-section. Right. Uh, one year of growth is usually represented by a ring consisting of a light part and a dark part. The darker wood isn't formed in the winter, uh, as some people believe, because the cambium is completely inactive in the winter. Yeah, and the following year, a new two-part uh, ring is added, and the older rings are closest to the center of the tree. So the tree ring, uh, tree grows in diameter um, because it, it manufactures new cells around its uh, circumference, not because the, the old cells get larger. Right. The old rings form the heartwood of inactive cells. This is the dead part of the tree. The live portion includes only the most recent rings. The dead wood is the largest part of the tree and it's often darker. Right. So many scientists see these rings as kind of a surefire way uh, to determine the age of trees and sometimes right. try to use the data to claim that the biblical chronology is wrong. If one ring equals one year, then all we need to do is count up the rings and see if they are older than the biblical chronology would allow. Sure. The, the oldest living trees, such as the Bristol Cone Pine trees of the White Mountains in Eastern California, were dated in 1957 by counting tree rings at 4,723 years old. This would mean they predated Noah's flood, right. which, which occurred around 4,300 years ago or so, uh, taking a straightforward approach to biblical chronology. So not only do Bible skeptics quote this as proof that the Bible is wrong, but old earth creationists and theistic evolutionists also yeah. use this type of uh, a claim to say we don't need to take the Bible as plainly written as far as the age of the earth is concerned. Right. But when the interpretation of scientific data contradicts the true history of the world, as revealed in the Bible, then it's the interpretation of the data that's at fault. That's the perspective we need to have. It's important to remember that we have limited data, and the new discoveries have uh, new discoveries often overturn previous uh, so-called hard facts. Right. Now, the first thing we should notice here is that this is a uniformitarian argument, right. right? The present is the key to the past. So what you're saying is that the rates of processes that you've observed today have uh, have always been constant, and so you can extrapolate that back into the past. Yeah, and, and, and that's a reasonable assumption in most cases. Right. Both creationists and evolutionists use uniformitarian arguments, right? right? The thing about them is that creationists acknowledge that you can't know if they're correct for sure because no one witnessed the rates or processes throughout the length of time that they supposedly took place. Right. So uh, all you're uh, doing is extrapolating. And as a matter of fact, both parties will argue that processes didn't happen at the same rates if they contradict their own paradigm. So, uh, you know, we might both say, well, yeah, if you extrapolate back, this proves creation. But if it doesn't seem to fit that, then we argue the other way. And evolutionists do the exact same thing. Yes. So we'll give you an example of that when we get back in 60 seconds. 
Most people have experienced the frustration of failing to find a location because they've been given confusing directions. But even though humans can often be hopeless at giving directions, the humble honeybee manages to give excellent directions, even though it does so in a very unusual way. Scientists have long known that when honeybees discover a new food source, they return to the hive and perform a special dance that remarkably informs the other bees where to find the food. But this dancing mode of communication Communication is so complicated that it took Austrian naturalist Karl von Frisch 20 years to decipher it. Since complicated dance routines require the planning and forethought of an intelligent choreographer, wouldn't it be reasonable to conclude that a super intelligent mind programmed the bees with this remarkable form of communication? To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking today about tree ring dating, dendrochronology. Right. Now, we were mentioning uh, how tree ring dating is a uniformitarian argument. Right. How both creationists and evolutionists acknowledge the validity of uniformitarian arguments and that both use them. Creationists are quick to point out the problems with them as being absolute dating methods. And, of course, evolutionists will abandon specific uniformitarian ideas if they contradict evolutionary timescales. Right. For example, evolutionists believe that the moon is 4.6 billion years old. A highly accurate lunar laser ranging measurements have shown that the moon is receding from the Earth at a rate of about 4 centimeters a year or so. But the moon could never have been closer to the Earth than about 18,000 kilometers or 11,000 miles or so. That's known as the Roche limit because the Earth's tidal forces would have shattered it. Uh, but even if the moon had started receding from being in contact with the Earth, it would have taken only 1.37 billion years or so to reach its present distance. Note that this is the maximum possible age, uh, age for, for the, the moon uh, for, the, for reaching that distance. Far too young, in any case, for evolution and, and much younger than radiometric uh, dates assigned to moon rocks. Uh, it, it's not the actual age. Right. So evolutionists don't abandon their belief in a 4.6 billion year old moon right. based on that data. Yes. Right? So what they do is they, they argue that things must have happened differently in the past and that, that this altered this uniformitarian idea. Right. So, you know, perhaps meteor impacts or that the moon used to be coming towards us and got trapped and is now swinging away or whatever. But you're yep. not going to accept it because it goes outside of those boundaries that you've already predetermined and so you come up with a, a saving mechanism, so to speak. Right, yes. Uh, there's an example where uniformitarian philosophy was abandoned when it didn't yield the dates preferred by evolutionists. Right. So is there a comparable scenario in our topic today of tree ring dating? Yes, the Bristol Cone Pines uh, were dated, as, uh, as we said before, 4,723 years old by counting the rings. Right. But recent research on seasonal effects on tree rings in other trees in the same uh, genus, uh, the plantation pine, has revealed that up to five rings per year can be produced and extra rings are often indistinguishable even under the microscope from annual rings. Now, evidence of false rings in any woody tree species would, of course, cast doubt on claims uh, that any particular species has never uh, in the past produced false rings. So evidence from within the same genus surely counts much more strongly against such a notion. Um, considering that the immediate post-flood world would have been wetter, with less contrasting seasons until the post-flood ice age waned, many extra growth rings would likely have been produced in the bristlecone pines. So right. taking this into account, uh, it could easily bring the age of the oldest living bristlecone pine down to the post-flood era easily. Right. Another example of an old tree is now the world's largest single stem tree by, by wood volume and mass. It's the giant sequoia named General Sherman, located in California's Sequoia National Park. It's over 83 meters tall, about 275 feet, and has a diameter at the base of 25 feet, 7.7 .7 meters. It's huge. The, its total bulk is more than 10 times Times that of a blue whale. This thing's huge. General Sherman was originally said to have been more than 6,000 years old, but that has now been revised to be around 2150 or so. Uh, Nate Stevenson of the U.S. Geological Survey said, he said this, uh, the new Sherman tree age estimate could still be off by centuries. 
Right. <laughs> so, so how, um, using a very simple method of just counting tree rings, can dates be subject to such dramatic alteration? Good question. Uh, well, well, most people presume that an old um, tree's age is derived from just counting the rings from a, a full depth core sample. But this is hardly uh, ever so. Right. In the case of General Sherman, only foot-long samples were taken and cross-matched with each other by looking for similar indicator or, or distinct rings. Mm -hmm. So mathematical assumptions are then made to calculate the age of the tree by comparing measurements from other sequoia stumps. Right, a uniformitarian, uh, the, the present is the key to the past approach, is then applied when calculating dates, which doesn't allow for differences in past climates, which can affect growing seasons, for example, and even produce extra rings. This has been shown in the case of General Sherman to be very inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And it'd be more accurate if samples uh, could be taken right through to the tree's core or, or, or pith. Of course, but, yeah. but such procedures are very difficult on huge trees as core samples are usually only pencil thin. And this is because a full depth procedure using large power equipment would of course involve significant damage to the tree. Right. And so in short, longer dates have been assumed due to the enormous size uh, of the tree. So again, here we see how um, uniformitarian assumptions can be useful to a certain degree, but they can't, th this highlights again what we're talking about. It's historical science, not observable science. We're yes. not making direct observations. So to date something, it's very hard to do. And more on this when we get back in just a moment. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Well, in this week's episode, we're talking about dendrochronology or tree ring dating. And as we've seen, this straight up counting of tree rings uh, is not as simple as some, some people think. Yeah. So uh, some trees have been seen to produce up, up to five uh, rings per year, as we mentioned before. And, and the bristle bristlecone pine trees we mentioned before that supposedly uh, date beyond the biblical chronology have not had direct experiment experiments performed on, on them, but there's good reason to think that they've grown more than one ring per year. Right, yeah. Um, here we'll, uh, we'll share some research and a hypothesis put forward by John Wood Morapi that multiple ring growth per year, known as multiplicity, may benefit these trees under certain environmental conditions. Growing in the White Mountains of Eastern California are what are thought to be some of the oldest living trees on Earth. The trees with the most rings uh, the, one of the trees with the most rings is dubbed Methuselah yeah. and uh, is thought to be about 4,600 years old. Now, one might expect that that area might have some of the best growing conditions on Earth, mm. but in fact, the opposite is true. Right. Ironically, the alleged oldest trees grow in some of the worst imaginable conditions. Yeah. Conditions are so bad that few other plants can survive. Uh, short, cool summers with, with a growing season thought to have been uh, only several weeks long. Uh, Desert-like uh, aridity. Um, we've got 250 millimeters of, of precipitation per year, mostly is snow. Yeah, wow. uh, many, many trees grow out of little more than cracks in the, in the rocks. Right, in addition, strong winds coupled with air that in the summer is said to be the driest on earth and rocky uh, soil, what you could call soil, uh, where there is any soil means that what little rain does fall will evaporate or, or drain away quickly. It may be these exceptionally harsh growing conditions are the key to understanding why some of the bristlecone pines have so many rings that appear that they, they appear to have lived about ten times longer than other bristle cone pri, uh, pines growing in in other in, in better conditions. Right, uh, Woodmorap proposes that under conditions where water is scarce, bristle cone pines. Uh, they, they multiply thin rings per year rather than one thick ring as has been documented in other species. Further, he hypothesizes that this growth habit helps the tree to conserve resources, especially water, in these harsh conditions. Yeah, uh, it, it may be that these exceptionally harsh growing conditions are the key to understanding why some of these bristle cone pines have so many rings that they appear to live about 10 times longer than bristle cone pines which are growing in comparatively good conditions. Yeah. 
Perhaps the best evidence that some bristlecone, bristlecone pines can grow multiple rings per year is the fact that it has already been demonstrated. Uh, yeah. Lamons, a, a creationist, induced multiple uh, ring growth in sapling bristlecone pines by simply stimulate, uh, simulating a two-week drought. Yeah, wow. Now, some dismiss this evidence saying that while multiplicity has been demonstrated in young bristlecone pines, it hasn't been demonstrated in mature bristlecone pines and therefore may not occur in mature bristlecone pine trees. Right. While this could be true, the burden of proof should be on those who propose that what happens in immature trees doesn't happen in mature trees. Exactly. An expert in genus Pinus didn't seem to have any problem believing that white mountain bristlecone pines grew multiple rings per year. In his book, The Genus Pinus, N.T. Murov states, quote, Apparently, a semblance of annual rings is formed after every rather infrequent cloudburst. So wow. if an expert like Miroff readily accepts multiplicity in these bristlecone pines, then perhaps the doubters of this notion should at least give the, the evidence to, uh, you know, a serious examination here. Right. So it's important to understand that the idea that mature trees can grow more than one ring per year is not a highly speculative hypothesis. Uh, it's, a well it's well established, in fact, that mature trees of many species, both uh, uh, di di different kinds of species, including other uh, species of the genus Pinus can grow multiple rings per year, especially under the types of conditions which some, which some of the bristlecone pines, anyways, in the White Mountains grow in. Exactly. A researcher named Glock published a large study in 1960 documenting the common occurrence of multiple ring uh, growth per year under conditions similar to those in the White Mountains. They found that multiplicity was more than twice as common as annularity and conclude that probably very few annual increments um, o o over the entire tree consist of only one growth layer, well, only one ring per yeah, year. Cool. So in addition to solid direct evidence that these bristlecone pines may have been capable of growing multiple rings per year, there's abundant indirect evidence of multiplicity. Right. And when we get back, we're going to have a, a parable to help people understand why the Bible is the best starting place when trying to determine how old something is. We'll be right back. In the early 90s, researchers from Montana State University made a startling discovery. Inspecting a piece of T-Rex bone under a microscope, they could hardly believe their eyes. They could see dinosaur red blood cells. This discovery prompted lead scientist Dr. Mary Schweitzer to say, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? In a Discover magazine article, Dr. Schweitzer explained further her surprise. If you take a blood sample and stick it on a shelf, you have nothing recognisable in about a week. So why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? Such a response is understandable, considering that she thinks dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But surely such data suggests it wasn't that long ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject today is tree ring dating. Yes, well, we've seen that tree ring dating is certainly not an absolute dating method that unequivocally, uh, unequivocally disproves the Bible, and, and yet we've seen so many Christians shaken in their faith by claims like this. Yep. Uh, you know, they watch a show by a, you know, on National Geographic or Discovery Channel, and they find it, yeah. well, it's a real challenge because of the seemingly scientific nature of the, the proof that's presented. Right. So we thought we'd, we'd share a parable from our website, uh, by Garth Weeb that might help people to understand the concept of biblical authority and well here it is. Here's the parable of the candle. Parable of the candle. Okay. Uh, Chris and Lucy entered a building looking for Manuel. In a room they found a note and a lighted candle. Chris looked at the note and read it aloud. Hi, it's 2.30. I'm leaving to run some errands. I'll be back in a couple of hours. By the way, the electricity is out so I lit a candle for you, Manuel. Then Lucy said, I know how we can find out how long it's been since he left. Look, the candle has been burning since he lit it, and there's a significant amount of wax that's melted and dripped down. If we figure out the rate at which the wax is melting and measure the amount of wax that has thus far dripped, we can work backwards to find out how long it is since he left. Right. And uh, I... I've known Manuel for a long time, and this is his handwriting, Chris said. 
Why waste your time? The note said that he left at 2.30. Lucy said, don't believe everything you read. Chris <laughs> replied, look, I've known Manuel for a long time, and this is his handwriting. Don't be ridiculous. Lucy replied, ah, yes, but what does he mean by 2.30? A note like this is subject to interpretation. Oh, yes. Suppose he was talking about another time zone or something, and so a short philosophical argument ensued about the note. However, Lucy prevailed and insisted on performing the measurements and calculations. Okay, continuing on, a few minutes later, Lucy announced, well, I've got some bad news for us. Based on the amount of wax that has melted and the rate at which the wax is melting, I can confidently tell you that it has been at least one whole day since this guy left. And he was probably talking about 2.30 yesterday. And since he said, I'd be back in a couple of hours, we can assume something happened to him and he's not coming back at all. So much for your note. <laughs> <laughs> Just then, Manuel walked in. Lucy said, are you this guy, Manuel? What took you so long? Manuel replied, what are you talking about? I left you guys a note saying I'd be back in a couple of hours. It hasn't even been that long. Uh, Lucy said, never mind the note. I measured the amount of wax that has dripped off your candle and the rate which the, and the, rate which the max, wax was melting. I know you've been gone since yesterday. Yeah, wow. Uh, Manuel replied, but the candle isn't burning anywhere near as brightly as when I first lit it. Also, I didn't light a new candle, but he used one, and I used another candle to light this candle, and in the process, some of the wax spilled uh, down over this, this other candle. <laughs> Lucy said, so you said up that candle to, to deceive us, to make it look like you left the room over a day ago when in fact it's been less than a couple of hours. Manuel replied, replied, look, I left you a note telling you when I left. I never intended for you to conduct some silly experiment measuring wax dripping off a candle to figure out when I left. I put the candle there so you guys would have some light. You can see the parallels there, right? <laughs> Between th this, this is kind of what's happening. It's a silly little story, a little, little bit of fun actually. Yeah. Um, but people, we've got the Bible, God's written. Account. It's the note that says when God created, how how He created, what the sequence that was. Then there was right. a global flood, and then all kinds of other events there. And, and people are saying, well, well, ignore the note. And, and let's do silly measurements, like uh, how, how old is this tree here? Let's count the rings. Yeah. And say, you know. Let's let our fallible human mind yeah. uh, override the authority of God's word, because what you're actually doing, the first step when you do these things, when you see a, you know, an old earth creationist or you see a theistic evolutionist, you know, countermanding what the Bible is saying plainly, what their, yeah. their yeah. first thing they're saying is, my mind has more authority than God's word, and it is it is able right. to uh, figure out these things without God giving me the knowledge. Yeah. Without revelation, I can, I can take, well, maybe there's a little bit of revelation in there, but we're going to reveal the true meaning of this text. So they're raising their own opinions and their own beliefs above God's word. Right. And you, I've actually had people say that, those things. Well, did God deceive us because the earth looks so old? No. Yeah. Actually, the evidence points to a young earth, and we can take God at his word. It does. And we'll be back. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong, while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate, particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. All right, welcome back. We're going to look at a uh, at feedback. Uh, we often get emails into the ministry through the website, and here's one from Dr. S.K. from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and he's he, the, the the initial comments here. He was surprised to read about an objection to intelligent design from a prominent theistic evolutionist in a book that he uh, co-authored with his wife, and he asked for our input. And this was the note that he sent in. Alistair McGrath, uh, with whom I find myself in agreement on virtually every occasion, wrote in The Dawkins Delusion on page 30, a paragraph condemnatory of intelligent design. And here's the paragraph. Mm -hmm. The real problem here, however, is the forced relocation 
of God by doubtless well-intentioned Christian apologists into the hidden recesses of the universe beyond evaluation or investigation. Now that's a real concern, for this strategy is still used by the intelligent design movement, a movement based primarily in North America that argues for intelligent design based on gaps in the scientific explanation such as irreducible complexity of the world. It is not the approach which I accept, either on scientific or theological grounds. In my view, those who adopt this approach make Christianity deeply and needlessly vulnerable to scientific progress. That's the quote from Alistair McGrath, and the fellow who wrote in said, I'm flabbergasted and in total disagreement. How, uh, I am, however, at a loss for words and would most appreciate your thoughts on this. He's asking uh, CMI for our thoughts on this. Right, and one of our, our fellows did respond. Uh, he said, uh, hi, SK. I'm glad you haven't fallen for the mistake that Alistair or Joanna McGrath are making here. This is a common charge leveled against creationists and intelligent design proponents, but it simply fails to stick. Um, he says some other comments, but I'm just going to skip a little bit. Uh, for example, it's exceedingly rare if it occurs at all, define any examples of highly complex specified genetic information spontaneously arising in nature, even though if evolution is true, we ought to see thousands of examples of it all around us. An evolutionist would always cling to the idea that an unknown naturalistic cause for such features might one day be discovered, but in many cases, especially in origin sciences, this begins to look desperate. It's, it's a resort to naturalism of the gaps. Yeah. It's not God yeah. of the gaps, it's naturalism of the gaps. Defaulting to naturalistic explanations without justification is equally as problematic and precarious as the God of the gaps. Yet no evolutionist ever seems to warn against making that mistake. Instead, they seem perfectly at home presuming naturalism even when it defies common sense. However, if the most plausible naturalistic causes are eliminated, that that at least makes the conclusion that God is the designer more convincing than it would have seemed otherwise. We, we hear this all the time. God of the gaps, God of the gaps. We're not yeah. arguing for God of the gaps. When you see in, you know, information inside living things, where does yeah. information come from? Where has it always been shown to come from? Yeah. It coded information. Yeah, the God of the gaps idea is that, well, we don't know about you know, where information comes from, and so... Well, it must be miraculous. We'll just we'll just put God into that gap there. That's the uh, the, the the terminology God of the gaps. That's where that comes from. Right. But in the case of information, like is being discussed here, we know where information comes from. It right. comes from intelligence. How about, always. How about where life came from? Has yeah. Have we, how have we ever seen life come into being? Well, life begats life. That that's all we've ever seen. It's right. A scientific law. But <laughs> if you're an atheist and you believe that life somehow came into being spontaneously millions or billions of years ago, you've got no proof of it, no evidence, no eyewitness accounts, and yet you believe it happened. You believe that one of the fundamental laws of science was broken in the past based on no proof. That's a naturalism the, of, of the gaps. Of the is gaps. what that is. Uh, theory. So yeah. <laughs> Next week on Creation Magazine Live, more amazing design in animals. We did a show on this. Yep. We're going to add more amazing design in animals next week. We'll see you then.